things you see a lot of in our culture when, when you're walking around, uh, just when you're on the internet, whatever, are images of uh, people with like the ideal body, right? Like fitness is a huge industry in our world. I think it's like $82 billion globally or something like that. And it, it's a lot of money that people spend on wanting to look a certain way, right? To make their bodies conform to whatever that, that image, that ideal is. And, and I think what those images do is, uh, is, is that it causes us to kind of admire and, and maybe be inspired sometimes, but also to feel kind of discouraged and to feel despairing. Because you know that you'll never, you'll never actually look like that, you know? Uh, like, I, I have gone through phases where I've lifted weights regularly, drank the protein shakes, ate, eaten Vector for breakfast, you know, the whole deal. And, like, I do months of this and maybe put on, like, three pounds of muscle, right? And, and then I don't work out for a couple weeks and poof, it's gone just like that. Like, I'm just not going to be the cover, you know, fitness cover magazine model. Not that that was like a dream of mine and you're like, you're kind of in the wrong business for that, but uh, it's just not going to happen, right? And I, I think that's how some people feel spiritually, I think, when they look at a guy like Paul in the Bible, is they go, well, I can, I can believe that there's somebody like that out there who does these things, who says these kinds of things, but I know that could never be me. I know that I could never be really anything like a guy like Paul. And I, I just kind of want to acknowledge that because the story we come to this morning in, in Philippi, I think is a story that, that kind of really puts Paul in a really, really good light. I mean, you look at him here and you go, wow, what a guy. And I want to acknowledge that some of us are going to feel a little bit uh, like this is, this is an unattainable, un, unrelatable uh, kind of person. And, and I want to kind of look at this story and see what might be right or might, what might be wrong about that perception. But first, a little bit of context. Uh, where we were last week, so Paul and his gospel buddies, I'm like 65% sure that's what they would have called each other, uh, they're, they're in the city of Philippi, and uh, they've seen a woman named Lydia, an independent, successful businesswoman, and her whole family come to faith in Jesus. You know, uh, Daniel was talking about that, about a family that just kind of spreads, right? It, it becomes contagious. So Lydia and her whole family come to faith in Jesus. And then uh, Paul sends a, a fortune-telling demon out of a girl. And so she is, she's delivered, she's rescued, but this enrages her slave owners, who then, we talked about last week, sharing is caring, right? You want to share the rage with others. So they, they get the authorities enraged and the crowds enraged. Uh, Philippi is a very, very pro-Roman city. You don't mess with Rome. You don't do anything that would kind of counteract Rome and the emperor. And so they throw, they throw Paul and Silas in prison after beating them with rods. That's kind of where we left them. In, uh, in Acts chapter 16. So let's pray one more time and then get into it, starting in verse 25. Lord, thank you uh, so much for this morning. Thank you already, Lord, for, the, for what, we have, what we have sung, how we have worshipped you, and, and what we have heard, uh, Lord, about the work that you're doing in the world. And I pray today, Lord, as we spend time now in your word, I pray you'd speak clearly through me. I pray that you would, you would speak to our hearts, Lord, whatever it is that we've come with, that needs to be addressed, that needs to be challenged, needs to be convicted, needs to be comforted. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would do this. In Jesus' name, amen. So Acts 16, verse 25. Uh, it'll be on the screen. You can open up your Bibles as well. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. 
At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. What a, so many connections between what we've just heard. Filled with joy because they'd come to believe. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No, let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates. And when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them, and then they left. You know, the thing that stands out to me most right at the beginning is that first verse. Singing and, uh, and praising God. Like, you put yourself in their shoes. They have been publicly stripped, beaten with, with rods, thrown into prison, feet fastened in stocks because they did something good right? They delivered a girl. They helped her. And this is what happens. They're being treated like, like criminals who were on the verge of a killing spree or something like that. Like there's no justice here. Like I, I just, I don't know if I've ever had somebody seriously try to harm me. I think last, I was in a fight in like grade two. It was a pretty mild fight. There were no canes or rods involved at all, right? I just don't know what this is like. Like, I put myself in their shoes, and that, that, that kind of uh, injustice. And if I, if I were them, I think I'd be really, really angry at the authorities. I'd be really angry at the, at the magistrates for going along with this, again, for just treating me so unfairly. I think if I'm honest, I'd, I could easily become angry with God, too, right? Because, because if you're Paul and Silas, why are you in Philippi? You're there because God sent you there. You know, it was, it was the name of Jesus that sent the demon fleeing. It wasn't even Paul. It was Jesus' fault. What's going on here? You know, like he's the one who brought him here. So if you're Paul and Silas, you could be saying, God, I did your will. I did the thing you wanted me to do. And you didn't protect me. You didn't keep these things from happening. Instead, look where we are. Right? Like you could see that. Let's be honest, right? It'd be pretty easy to be frustrated and angry with God because of the pain that you had gone through because you had done his will. And, and maybe that did go through Paul and Silas's mind. Maybe that was a temptation. Maybe that was a flashing thought. But they didn't stay there, that's for sure. Look how they actually respond. They respond by singing hymns and, and praying. They are, they are worshiping God. They're actually praising him. Reminds me of a, of a story in 2 Samuel, a story that's often struck me. Uh, so after King David has this affair with Bathsheba and then, uh, and then has her husband Uriah killed, God kind of confronts David through, through a prophet and says, this child that's going to be born from this, this affair that you had, the child's not going to make it. And so David spends the next week, seven whole days, he spends on the ground, in sackcloth, refuses to eat. Some of us have gone all out in prayer for something, right? We've gone all out with God. I don't know if any of us have gone all out the way that David does here, right? We're just like sackcloth, lying down, no eating, anything like that, just begging God for the life of this child. One week goes by, David gets the news. This child has still died. I just think about how discouraged you would feel, right? Like one whole week. And you know what? Actually, I realize some of us, it's not just a week. Some of us prayed for, uh, for months and years for something passionately, zealously, and it didn't happen. So we can get this. Paul, or sorry, David, a whole week. But the first thing he does is he, um, he washes, changes clothes, goes to the house of the Lord, and he worships. First thing he does that's kind of like, like Acts 16, except in Acts 16, 
It's, there, there's such a sense of injustice here. I think it's even, even more extreme. And what we see in these stories is that worship is an intentional choice. Worship is not just something you do when you feel like it. It's something you actually can choose to do. You can say, despite what's going on, I'm going to worship. And I think when you do that, there are a couple of things that you realize. I think there are a couple of things that Paul and Silas realized as at midnight, they probably couldn't sleep when, you're, when you're, your back is like a checkerboard of open wounds. I'm imagining it's hard to sleep. And so as they're, as they're just lot, they're awake and they start praising, I think they, start, they probably re- realize two things. One thing, when you worship in the lowest place is that you remember that God is bigger than your circumstances. Because when we're in the midst of stuff, we can become really short-sighted, right? Like you could start to think this is the way things have always been. It's never been different. It's never going to be different. I have always felt this miserable and hopeless, right? And there's nothing else in the world that matters right now. This is the only thing that's happening right now. That's how we sometimes think, right? And what worship does is that it reminds us that actually our lives are but a vapor. They're but a breath. God is eternal. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And and he is the Lord of history. He's worked in the past. He's going to work in the future. And so so worshiping kind of takes our eyes off our circumstances and it gives us perspective. It reminds us of who God is bigger than those circumstances. But the other thing that worshiping in these low places, in prison, what it does is that it reminds us that God is at work in the circumstances too. That these circumstances are actually a great place for God to do some pretty incredible work in us and through us. Think about uh, Acts, I think it's Acts 5, where the apostles have been beaten and imprisoned. There's kind of a theme that goes on here a little bit in Acts. They're beaten, they're imprisoned. They are commanded not to talk about Jesus with anyone. So again, I'm thinking about what we heard a little bit earlier on. They're not allowed to talk about Jesus some restrictions that are pretty heavy, like heavier than what most of us experience, right? Like for a lot of us in the global West, it's like if somebody looks at us funny while we're praying publicly, that's a big deal. You can't get over that. You can't get through that. I mean, what if they think you're weird, right? Like that's, that's tough. But here they, they're like, this is pretty serious stuff. Beaten in prison, told you better not talk about Jesus anymore. You know how they respond, right? Like this is I, I, I've, got, I've come to this verse before. They leave the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. That is countercultural, my friends. They, were, they, they rejoiced because their eyes weren't on themselves. Their eyes were on Jesus. And they saw that Jesus was one who had gone before them, who had suffered in their place. And so I guess they're thinking, if this is happening to us, then we're on the right track. You know, it means that we're following Jesus. It means that we get to know him deeper. We get to, we get to participate with him. That's what Paul says in, in, in Philippians. He writes to the Philippians years later. He says, look, all I want to do is know Jesus. I just want to know him. I, I want to know his, the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. See, uh, these kinds of circumstances, when we worship, when we put our eyes on Jesus, they remind us that we're, we're with him. He's with us. We're, we're getting to know him in a deeper way. In fact, even in prison, as we're going to see, he can be made known through us in a special way. So again, worship is a, it's a choice. We choose to sing songs of praise to God, even when our spirits are so, so low. We, we choose to look at Jesus, remember what he has gone through, that he went to the cross for us. We choose to lift our eyes up to God when we're tempted to just focus on our circumstances. And when we do that over and over again, it becomes like a reflex. It becomes like a habit. It becomes a pathway that our souls have traversed so often that it becomes familiar. That when you're in the midst of this stuff, you go, this, this is what I do. I worship, I praise. When I was, uh, when I was a young adult, I was enduring a, 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 tr- a very, very difficult period, loneliness, family breakdown, parents' divorce, all kinds of things. Um, and and I, I discovered Psalm 13. And I started praying Psalm 13 over and over again. 
And the first four verses of Psalm 13 are pretty brutal. It's like, how long, Lord, are you gonna forget me forever? How long are you gonna hide your face from me? You know, look on me. If you don't pay attention to me right now, I'm gonna die. I'm literally gonna die. Like standard happy stuff like that, right? Just really upbeat kind of psalm. And I would pray these words and it was easy. It was easy to pray those first four verses (laughs) because I felt it. And then I come to verse five. Verse five has a shift. It goes, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord for he has been good to me. I was like, I don't want to say those words. I don't feel those words. But if I'm praying the first four, I got to pray the last two. And so I would force myself as much as I didn't feel like it to speak those words. The Lord is good. He has been good to me. I'm going to praise him. And, and as much as it kind of graded against what I felt like saying, it brought healing to my heart. It brought perspective to me. And so, um, so it might, you know, it might be challenging. And it might start in small ways for us. But when we look at Paul and Silas in prison, bloodied and battered and bruised, and we see them worshiping God, we can actually, by the, by the help of the Holy Spirit, we can do the same kind of thing today in our lives. We can. Yeah. Now, that's, that's kind of scene one. That's, that's worship. Let's look at the next kind of scene. We'll call this one love. Uh, so there's a bunch of things that lead up to the jailer's faith in Jesus. You have, uh, you have Paul and Silas praising. I think that that would, uh, that would strike the jailer, if he heard this happening, like I, I put them in stocks, they're beaten, they're bloodied, and they're singing praise to God. What is wrong with these guys? Did we beat them over the heads? I, I just remember the backs. I don't know. Like, you know, you'd be like, it, it would cause some real questions for the jailer. It's so counterintuitive, so countercultural. So I think that's maybe part of it. And then there's the earthquake. And uh, earthquakes, they're common in that area of the world. And they were understood in first century paganism to be theophanies, uh, manifestations of the divine. If there's an earthquake, you pay attention because God or the gods or who, whatever you believed in, they're, they're, they're saying something, they're doing something. Actually, you see that in, in Acts chapter 4. Again, there's some persecution. The believers gather together and they pray. And I know I come back to this prayer often because I just think it's so uh, informative for us, so instructive. Um, they pray not that the persecution would stop. They don't pray that uh, they would get comfortable. They pray instead that God would enable them to be bold, to keep speaking, to not fold under pressure, to not, they, they, they pray for resilience, right? They pray for endurance. And as they pray that, the place where they're meeting is shaken. There is essentially an earthquake and they're filled with the Holy Spirit and they speak boldly. You see, the same kind of thing as in Acts 16. The earth shakes and the Holy Spirit moves and that's what we need today as well. We need a little bit of earth shaking, maybe not literally, physically, necessarily, but we need a little bit of earth shaking. We need the Holy Spirit to empower us to be bold. That's what happens in Acts 16. I think that's what Paul and Silas are praying for, not not for comfort, not for the ending of of opposition, but instead praying, God, help us to be bold. And so he does. The the earthquake happens. Uh, It's incredible because the jail doesn't come crashing down on their heads. Instead, just the chains fall off. uh, Prison doors open. Uh, and the jailer rushes in, and he is, he's convinced that they're gone, that the, the prisoners are gone, and he knows that the penalty that he's going to pay for letting prisoners escape is going to be pretty, it's, it's going to be death. And so he decides he's, he's going to take care of this. He's going to do it himself. He's going to take his life. And um, let's, be, let's be honest. Let's be really honest here. If Paul and Silas didn't have time to escape from prison, before the jailer got there, if he takes his life, the prison break's gonna get a lot easier. That's kind of morbid, but that's the reality, right? If he takes his life, this is gonna get a lot easier. Every, they, they can all leave, no worries. He's the bad guy after all, right? He's the, he's the villain. He's the guy who inflicted this suffering on them. So just let him do it, and we can all walk away. But Paul doesn't let that happen. He speaks up. So stop, don't hurt yourself, we're all here. Not only did they not escape, but now Paul is saying, don't do anything to yourself. And, 
It didn't, it didn't hit me when I read it. I had to, somebody else pointed out to me, another writer, that Paul here shows us what it looks like to care for somebody else even in the midst of uh, suffering, right? Like he, he is in prison. He's in a position of weakness. He shows care and compassion for his persecutor. What a powerful witness that is, isn't it? When I was, when I was growing up, so I'm an Anabaptist background. If you don't know what Anabaptists are, kind of a um, group of Christians going back to the 16th century, what was called the Radical Reformation. Uh, these are like Mennonite, Amish, basically anyone with a chin strap beard and a pitchfork. You're, you're, you're in uh, if, you're, if you're part of that crew. And every Anabaptist grows up with the story of Dirk Willems. So Dirk Willems was a 16th century Dutch Anabaptist who was imprisoned because of the dangerous and subversive crime of believing and teaching that baptism was not for infants, but instead for, uh, for believers as a response of, of faith. So that was his belief, that was his teaching, that landed him in prison. One night, I don't know how it happened, but he escaped, escaped out of prison, and he flees, and, and, and he flees over this, uh, this frozen lake. He's pretty, he's pretty light. He's a pretty skinny guy, surviving on prison rations. He just kind of flies over the ice, right? His guard chases him, not quite as live. And so he, he's chasing him across the ice, crashes through the, the ice, and he's, uh, he's, he's drowning. Like, he's, he's done for. Dirk Willems, like Paul and Silas, he could be home free, right? He could be gone. That's it. Instead, he looks back, he sees the guy drowning, and he runs back and he saves him, lifts him up out of the water. Now, unfortunately, the story doesn't have a happy ending because the guard wanted to let him go, but the guard superior said, no, 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 he's still dying. And so Dirk Wilms was executed a little bit a while later on. So maybe you're like, well, maybe this isn't a good thing to do. But that witness has, has carried on for 500 years. This is a story that's been retold again and again of what it means to follow Jesus. This is actually a statue in my, I'll call it my hometown of Steinbach, Manitoba. Which, I mean, you look at that, you're like, look at that natural beauty, hey? Like, why would I have ever left that place for here? I mean, look at the, look at the flatness and the, and the industrialness. Anyways, yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> but this, this, uh, so this, the statue is up there commemorating this, this act. I mean, I, I, think, I think what we see in Paul and what we see in a guy like Dirk Willems is simply following Jesus. This is what Jesus told us to do. He told us to pray for our persecutors. He told us to love our enemies. He modeled it himself. I mean, he's up there on the cross saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. In fact, the very act of going to the cross. Paul says in Romans, we were his enemies. You might die for somebody who's your friend, a good man. We were his enemies because of our sin, and he went to the cross for us. And so, so this is, it's, it, again, it's, it's a, we might do it in smaller ways. It may not be a big dramatic act like Paul in prison or, or uh, Dirk Willems in, in the Netherlands, but when we look for the good of those, even those who have set themselves against us, who have opposed us. That is a powerful witness of the way of Jesus in the world. And we see that even a little bit, you know, here at the bridge, there are a couple of people I've heard from who, you know, have, are brand new to Christian faith, being exposed to it for the first time through the bridge, and they've been blown away simply by the fact that we've got, like, kids programs and that we have like alpha and we're serving people meals and we've got these meal trains and just these acts of love that don't gain financial benefit and they've, they're kind of blown away by that. Like, whoa, this is incredible. So even, even that, it's not even like loving our enemies. It's just simply seeking the benefit of others is a powerful witness. So I'll repeat what I said earlier with worship. It may start in smaller ways and it might feel really challenging. It's, it's pretty counterintuitive. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can do things like this today too. Let's move on to the next part, which is where uh, the, the jailer actually comes to faith in Jesus. So he, he rushes in. The earthquakes happened. Paul and Silas stop him from doing anything. And um, he falls before them and he asks, what do I need to do to be saved? Which is an interesting question. And there's a couple of explanations for what he means by this. 
what kind of salvation is he talking about? I think this is what makes the most sense, at least to me. That if you put yourself in his perspective, in his worldview, this earthquake is a sign of the God's displeasure, right? And he knows that these two guys are teaching, are advocating this to you, a new God connected with some guy named Jesus, and, and you know that you've participated in this injustice, that you've treated them badly, and now there's this earthquake that has set them free. And so you're thinking this God has intervened to save these guys, and I'm on the wrong side of this, right? I'm under condemnation. I'm under judgment because I'm against them, and this very powerful God is with them. And so I think the jailer's question is, how do I get out from underneath this? How do I get onto the right side? How do I avoid these consequences? And, and Paul and Silas uh, point him to Jesus. This is the same kind of thing that happens in Acts chapter 2. So in Acts 2, you get this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The disciples are speaking in tongues in these different dialects that, that they have no business knowing. They're, they're speaking, and then, and then people hear this, and they're cut to the heart. They go, oh, we helped crucified Jesus. We cheered for his crucifixion. We're, we're on the wrong side of this. God has raised him from the dead. And so they say to Paul or, or to Peter in Acts 2, they say, what do we need to do? Same kind of question that the jailer is asking. Peter in Acts 2, Paul in Acts 16, they point the way to Jesus. They say, you got to believe in the Lord Jesus. And, and let me talk about this belief for a second. Some people think that belief is merely saying, I agree with this set of facts. You know, here are some events. Jesus existed, he was born, he died, he rose again. If you can say, yes, I agree that those things happened, the idea is that's, that's belief, that you're, you're saved, you're a Christian if you believe those things are true. No, that's not biblical saving faith. Biblical saving faith goes deeper than that. It's fundamentally about trust. I always... Um, so on, on Saturday morning, it didn't get into the, the announcements because we kind of planned it afterwards, but on sa this Saturday, six days from now, uh, we're going to be doing a, a kind of a Christianity 101 baptism class. So Saturday morning, 9 a.m., uh, would love for you to be there. And whenever I do that class, I always talk about this verse. And I, I use those windows upstairs as an illustration. You know those, those the floor-to-ceiling windows upstairs in the atrium? They're kind of freaky, Right? Like, have you ever gone up really close? Like, you're three stories up, and it's, it's a little bit nerve-wracking. It's like, it's like the Capilano Suspension Bridge, but it's free. You should tell all your friends. Get a thrill, like the cliff walk, but just it's in a church building. It's great. Uh, so I go to those windows, and I say, look, it's one thing for me to say that these windows are really strong and can hold my weight. I believe that, right? I could say that. But it's another thing for me to actually lean and put my full weight on them. And th I actually do this, and it is really freaky every time. But I do it. I put my whole weight on it, and I say, that's what faith is. Faith isn't just saying you believe something. Faith is actually acting on it. Faith is actually putting your weight into something, putting the weight of your life into it. It's, it's basing your identity and your purpose on this thing, believing that Jesus is capable of handling the full weight of your life. That's, that's what faith is. So I think Paul explains that to the Philippian jailer. He explains, this is who Jesus is. This is what Jesus has done. This is what it means for you to actually put your trust in him. And the Philippian jailer is pretty open to this. Because guess what? Like Daniel was saying earlier, he has seen the evidence of what a life looks like when it's, when it's got its weight on Jesus. He's seen Paul and Silas praising God in the midst of prison. He's seen them show love and care. He's seen a life that is transformed by Jesus and he wants in. And so he trusts in Jesus. Um, there, there's a couple of immediate impacts, like with Lydia. Uh, he and his family are baptized that very night. That's incredible. Reminds me of the story of Justin Bieber getting baptized in Tyson Chandler, a backup uh, NBA uh, center's bathtub in the middle of the night because he so badly needed to be baptized. That's a whole other story. It's my favorite baptism story. I'm not going to tell it right now besides that. But, uh, but right in the middle of the night, they're like, we've got, we've got to get baptized right now. So Paul and Silas do it again. Baptism is the normative 
regular response to faith in Jesus, if you've trusted in Jesus and haven't been baptized, where are you going to be on Saturday morning? Here, up, upstairs, whatever. <laughs> Baptism class, let's do this. But they get baptized right away. And then they, they also, uh, there's this, this care, this compassion, right? So they, they right away are, um, the, the Philippian jailer, he, he makes a meal for them. He washes them, washes their wounds. Um, John Chrysostom, early church father, he said, he washed and was washed. He washed them from their stripes and was himself washed from his sins. Beautiful, poetic, right there. So, and, and then he's filled with joy as well. That's the other impact, is that he's just filled with joy. Now, I think the worship in low circumstances, that, that can feel daunting to some of us. And the showing love and compassion, that can feel daunting to us. I wonder, actually, if the most daunting thing for some of us, what feels most unattainable, is this part, actually, where Paul explains about Jesus and helps bring this guy to faith in him, right? I think for some of us, that's the part that we're like, really like, I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. And I think we have to recognize that there are people who are especially gifted and anointed for evangelism, that there's really only one Apostle Paul. There's only one Billy Graham, right? Like not everybody is wired with the personality to just go strike up conversations with random strangers and, uh, and, and start praying with them to, to receive Jesus. I've always wished that I had that. I just don't seem to. I mostly have really awkward conversations when I try that. But, but some people are really wired for that. Some people aren't. But whether or not you're anointed, especially for evangelism, every follower of Jesus is called, is responsible to share their faith, to make Jesus known in their words and actions across the board. Uh, Peter says in his letter in the New Testament, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. If you live in this way, if you live in this way, there's going to be questions. People are going to go, what is different about you? And Peter says, you, you got to be ready to give an answer for that. You, you do need to share about Jesus with your words. But, he, but here's something that might help. In my reading this past week, I came across a quote by a New Testament scholar named Richard Bauckham. He wrote a book called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses that totally kind of shifted the paradigm in New Testament studies. Uh, the point is, this guy knows a thing or two about the biblical meaning of being a witness. And this is what he says. Witnesses in the Bible, Christian witnesses, are not expected, like lawyers, to persuade by the rhetorical power of their speeches, but simply to testify to the truth for which they are qualified to give evidence. See the difference there? A lot of times when we think about evangelism, about sharing faith, we think that we need to be the lawyer. We think we need to have this compelling case. We need to be able to counter every argument. You need to have a PhD in apologetics, right? Like this, you gotta you got be like the lawyer. And actually the biblical language is that you're a witness. You're the, you're the person on the stand. And you're not being asked to make the whole case. You're being asked to share what you have seen, what you have known. What do you know about Jesus from the scriptures? What has he done in your life? What impact has he made? You are not a lawyer, you're a witness. You give testimony according to what you have been given, what you are qualified to speak about. And so, so this is, this, again, it may not be that we are exactly like Paul or that we have the same kind of impact or plant a whole bunch of churches or anything like that. But by the Holy Spirit's help, we can do things like this. We can make Jesus known in our words. We can give testimony according to what he has given us. And the final scene of this whole story is, uh, it's kind of the most bewildering one. It's the end of, of Paul and Silas' stay in Philippi. It's this kind of rapid fire series of events. So the magistrates say these guys can go free. It's probably because of the earthquake as well. They, they're realizing we don't really want to mess with these guys. We'd rather get them out of town as quick as possible. So, uh, so they, they, want to, they want to release them. And this is where Paul pulls out the big guns. He's been holding this card, right? He's got his, the ace up his sleeve. He goes, go, here it is. We're citizens. We're not going anywhere. You owe us an apology. And this is so alarming for the magistrates because to, to beat a Roman citizen, especially without trial, 
was an incredibly serious offense. You would lose your position 100%. You'd be done for. And so the, the magistrates are, uh, they are on high alert here. Oh my goodness, what have we done? These guys are Roman citizens. And so they, they come to Paul and Silas. They kind of grovel. They, they apologize. They escort them out, personal escort. You know, I, I, I would imagine this is public, that people can see that Paul and Silas have been exonerated, that they're being escorted out by the authorities. Now the question is, why does Paul pull this out? Especially here. I, mean, I don't know why he doesn't pull it out earlier. He could have saved himself a lot of trouble, right, if he had said it the day before. I don't know exactly. But here, here's what I've, I've come to kind of believe about why Paul does it. I don't think it's because he feels the need for personal vindication. I actually think he does it because he cares about the church in Philippi. Because look, look at how this would work out. If, if this doesn't happen... If Paul and Silas kind of get like, like uh, expelled from the city in the middle of the night and you've got this, you've got this new church, right? This, this brand new vulnerable kind of body of believers. They're going to be under such a cloud of suspicion from the authorities, from, uh, from others in the city, right? You're like, oh, you're, you're those Christians, like those, those guys who were thrown in prison and we never heard from them again, right? It just, like, it just really puts them in a bad light from the beginning. And I wonder if part of the reason Paul does this is because he, he, wants, to, he wants to vindicate the name of Jesus. He wants to vindicate the church right from the start so that they essentially have a bit of a runway, to actually grow and develop. You know, that, that there's going to be some respect from the authorities from the beginning because Paul and Silas say they were actually Roman citizens. They were distinguished guys. And so, so maybe it gives the church a little bit of time to actually grow and be established. It's one thought. makes sense to me. And I certainly think we see that with Paul again and again, that his number one concern is never, it's not his own status, it's for the well-being and the growth of the church. And this is a desire that God honors in the scriptures. Um, Isaiah 62, Isaiah says, For Zion's sake I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake I will not remain quiet till her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. This is something God honors. You, you desire the vindication of his people. You desire his glory to be made known in his people. Whereas a passage like Amos 6, God rebukes the Israelites. He says, you drink wine by the bowl full. That's a different way of drinking wine. And use the finest lotions, but you don't grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, you'll be among the first to go into exile. You don't grieve over the ruin of God's people. The spiritual decay, this, this complacency, you, you think that as long as you're taken care of, as long as you're prosperous, it doesn't matter what happens to God's people. And I, that's convicting for me. That's maybe convicting for us because that's so easy to do, right? To just go, well, I'm good. Who cares about what else is happening? But no, this, this desire to say, God, I want your name to be lifted high. I want, I want your church to grow and, and to thrive and to be built up in this place. I want people to know who you are. That's, that's the desire I think that Paul has in Acts 16. And that's the desire I think we are to have as well. And this too, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can see working out in our own lives today. See, I started out this morning earlier on by talking about, you know, fitness models and kind of going, oh, I can never attain that, I can never look like that. And how we, we maybe do that same kind of thing with Paul spiritually. I can never be like that. And um, again, we're not going to have the same calling as Paul. We're not going to have the same impact as him. But, but here's the difference with the whole fitness thing is that uh, it's not just about your willpower, that actually the, the power to live in this way that is so compelling and countercultural and so on, the power doesn't actually come from you. It comes from the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that empowered Paul. In fact, this is what Paul says in Ephesians 1. He prays that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. 
That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. The same power that defeated death, that conquered the grave is in you. The same power. The same power that enabled Paul to live in that way in the first century dwells in you. See, I think the problem is so many of us have such a a small, anemic vision of who we are called to be. And I don't mean you're all called to become famous and rich and, you know, to have a blog that millions of people are... I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about your, your character. I'm talking about your fruitfulness. I'm talking about what God wants to do in and through you. Too many of us have such a limited vision of that because it's based on our own strength or lack thereof. And so we actually need to increase our vision of who we are called to be in the world, what God can do in us and through us. We need to increase our dependence on the Holy Spirit because with his help, we can live in ways like this. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we can praise God in the midst of the lowest of circumstances. With the help of the Holy Spirit, we can can make Jesus known in our words. We can love those who set themselves against us. And we can stop thinking so much about ourselves and and look at at the mission of God and, and the vindication of his name. May it be in me, may it be in you, may it be in us as a church that we would increase, that God would increase our vision through passages like this of what we can look like And may we lean fully in faith in Jesus and in in the power of the Holy Spirit that we would see it coming about in our day. Let's pray and let's, uh, let's worship. God, I praise you. I praise you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for the testimony of your saints. I think about uh, Hebrews 12, that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Lord, we're surrounded by guys like Paul, guys like Peter, guys like Dirk Willems in the 16th century, and so many others. And I thank you, Lord, that that rather than discouraging us or causing us to despair because we don't look like that, I thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that dwelt in them, dwells in us. And so I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to build us up. It's a process. It's going to be it's going to be a journey. But I pray, Lord, that we would not grow complacent, that we would not think that we've arrived, that we've made it, or that it's okay to just kind of stay stuck where we are, Lord, but that you would continue to grow us, lead us, make us more and more and more like you, Lord Jesus, so that we would live in this world as truly a city on a hill, a light in the darkness, Lord, that our lives, our worship, our words would be a compelling, contagious example of the kingdom of God. God. Come Holy Spirit, fill us anew, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us at the Bridge Church in this way. If God has spoken to you through his word, or if you're simply just wanting to reach out to pray, or just wanting to know a little bit more about our church, you can do that through accessing our website. There you can connect with us and also have access to different types of content. We are a church that lives to know Jesus Christ personally and to make him known. We believe that he is the hope of this world and wants to give you your hope as well. We believe that the best news ever has come in and through him. May you know him more and make him known today. We'd love to hear from you.